We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. If you've been listening to the pod, you know I'm marking my calendar for the big sale from Last Bottle Wines, one of our wonderful sponsors. If you don't already know, they're a Napa-based online wine shop that offers 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part, there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase, just a daily email with really great wine. And as I mentioned, they're having a massive sale. Their marathon sale is coming up on March 28th and 29th. They flip that one wine per day rule on its head and instead offer back-to-back, two-back deals. That means wines are only up on the site for a couple minutes at a time. We got a preview order with the mini marathon package of some of their favorites, and I'm telling you, it's a sale you want to get in on. And the best part is we're offering Datable listeners 10% off your first order with code Datable. Sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use the code Datable and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. Hi, I'm Yui Shu. And I'm Julie Kraftchik. We're active daters turned dating sociologists. Here to dive into everything modern dating and relationships. Welcome to the Datable Podcast. Welcome back to Datable, everyone. We're doing a special episode with just Julie and I. You'll hear only from us two because we have more than enough to talk about, just the two of us. We certainly do. And we were brainstorming topics the other day and the list did not fall short. I'll just say that. There is just so much that we want to get off our chests and really talk about because, you know, we've been doing this now for... 18 seasons, not 18 years, but eight years, you know, and we've learned a lot over that time. We both started this when we were in our 30s. Mm -hmm. We're now in our 40s. Julie barely entered this age bracket, but I'm well into my 40s now. And I still remember when we first met, there was something about turning 30. Oh, yeah. That freaks people out. It's a major milestone. And something about dating after 30 seems more difficult Mm -hmm. for some reason, or more people want to talk about it. It seems elusive. So we want to address exactly this topic. Does dating get harder after you turn 30? (laughs) I'm really glad we're going into this topic because I agree. There's a lot of like perceptions out there that, you know, you're supposed to kind of have your whole life in order. Like you're supposed to have your career in order. So as to have your love life, your finances, all this stuff, like 30 is that age we keep hearing that, you know, you got to get your shit in order by 30. But where did that even come from? And like we we're talking about the perception that dating gets harder once you hit this milestone age, we're going to dig into all of it and go through if we think that these, you know, perceptions out there hold any accuracy And in what ways they don't as well. And when we talked about this topic, I was telling Julie, 30 seems so young to me. Now at 43, if anybody talks about, 
oh, I'm meeting up with my friend so-and-so. They're 30. I'm like, wait, that's a baby in my (laughs) mind. But I had to rewind back to when I was 29, about to hit the 30 mark, Uh thinking how old I was and how behind I felt and how I wasn't living the life that I had imagined myself living by 30. I think 30 is that pivotal age too, because until then, everyone's kind of on the same page, give or take. Like you're with your friends, you're just getting Mm. started in your career in your 20s. You know, people are getting into relationships, but they're less serious or not as many marriages and children, all that stuff happening. You know, of course, different parts of the country are different, but especially in like some of the larger cities, we find a lot of people are kind of on the same page until that 30 Mm -hmm. hits. And then you see a lot of diversion. And I think that's part of, too, why it's kind of that freak out moment for people, because you're like, all of a sudden, I'm comparing myself and seeing that this person is further along here and I'm lagging behind. And am I going to get left behind? Those are all the thoughts that like go on in your head when you're hitting that milestone. If you think about it, I don't know if this is just me, but when I was young, thinking about aging, I didn't think about life past 30. <laughs> no. You know, just thought about, oh, you go to high school and then you go to college and then you get a job and then you get married and have kids and boom, you're like 35 and you're good. And I never thought about how you even get there. And the reason I had my freak out moment was because if you've been following along this podcast, I was proposed to when I was 27 by my boyfriend of five years. And my first reaction was to say, no, I'm too young. I'm not ready for marriage. But in my mind, I was also thinking, well, by 30, I'll be married. I'm just not Mm. ready for it yet. You know, in three years, I'll get there. And but when 30 hit, I was nowhere near marriage with anybody. I was single and I had a freak out moment. That's really interesting to think about like where we were, because I was at the total opposite of you. As Mm. someone that I feel like was a later bloomer, I started like dating more in my 20s, like 26, 27. Like that's kind of like, I would say maybe 27 on. Like, I feel like I was still in that, like, Mm -hmm. you know, going out partying stage in my like early to mid 20s. And then 27 ish, I started to get like more serious about using dating apps and actually going on dates. But that kind of led to like a series of maybe one sided relationships or, you know, situationships or something undefined. And it wasn't until 30 that I actually had like my first like real serious relationship where I like really fell in love. So I think leading up to that, I was like, I feel behind because I haven't had that yet. Yeah. But it's also, even if you did have that, I think a lot of people still felt behind if they were still single and not married by 30. If just for some reason, that 30 mark, when you like no longer write two (laughs) as part of your age, you think I'm a full-blown adult. I should be living this adult life. But what does this adult life look like? Because our late 20s bleed into our early 30s. They're kind of the same genre, if you think about it. But that age, it just does something to you psychologically. Well, I think that's what it is, that you're supposed to be an adult. And you kind of (laughs) touched on this. Like, you know, you have the formative years planned out, like you're in high school, then college, and you get a job, and then you have kids. And I mean, there is some part of it that is, there is a very real age pressure with children. Like there is a biological clock that we can't fully ignore. But I think this actually is perfect to bring us to like one of the first big perceptions of why it's so hard to date in your 30s. And that really comes down to the fact that you're running out of time. Hmm. There's this feeling that like, you know, again, like everyone's moving forward and you're behind. And if you don't have kids soon, like you'll never have kids. There's a lot of that fear mongering going on. So yeah, I think we should break this one down because that one I think is a very real one that I know I experienced. What is that time pressure? Is that the, I mean, to speak for us as women, it's a biological ticking clock. That is very real. I get that. But on top of that, there's something else too, like in, like you're running out of time in the dating pool. Yes. There's going to be less and less options for you. Yes. Well, I think some of it's for women too. There's this feeling like you get less desirable the older you are. Again, I don't believe in it, but that is something that we've been told through our lifetime. It's interesting though, because like men, I feel like at least hetero men, I think there is this pressure still 
we've heard it from listeners that we've talked to, yeah. even though they don't have maybe those societal norms, there's still this feeling like I need to move my life along. Maybe it's not as drastic as for women, but it's still there. And is it also because mid to late 20s, we're starting to see the first phase of marriages? Yeah, I agree. I think it's that for sure. So we're sure. going to a ton of weddings, kind of feeling like, oh, maybe I should be next. And I remember going to like five weddings in one year. Yeah. And me being, you know, didn't have a plus one thinking, wow, we're, I'm nowhere near these five couples right now. Maybe that's what it is. It's just more obvious than in your 20s. It was kind of like what I was saying earlier is like everyone's kind of on the same page in your 20s. And then all of a sudden in your 30s, that's when people start to diverge. So yeah, if you're the only one showing up at these weddings, I agree. I had that moment too, where I was like, am I literally the only single person here? And I remember like yeah. being like afraid to go to some weddings and my therapist just being like, no one is paying attention to you being single. Like they're just trying to get to open bar. Like this is your right. own shit that's going right. on for you. But it was definitely there. And I also felt like I was getting left behind by my friends. Like I remember having this like the bad breakup you know, after my like first love in the 30s. And of course, like some of it was because of him and I missed him, etc. But a lot of it was myself, like thinking like it was my last chance to find someone yes. or I'm going to be left behind. Like all my friends are going to move on. They're now together. They have no need for me. Like those were the stories that were running through my mind. Yeah, it's kind of like musical chairs, isn't it? It's like I'm about to run out of chairs to sit on. And then where do I go? I lose this game of life. Yeah. And the other thing that really bothered me was I was going to weddings of people younger than me. Mm. So I remember going to a wedding of one of my friends who was 25. Yes. 30. She that was 25. To me too. Yep. <laughs> and all her wedding guests were younger than me. All of my prospects for anybody to hook up with that night were younger than me. And I just felt like such an old hag being at her wedding. Like, wow, am I a loser here? Well, I remember feeling that way with like my family because like my brother, my two cousins, oh, yeah. they all got married in like practically within one or two years of one another. And yeah. I'm the oldest. And I'm like, I'm so far from getting married and I'm the oldest. So it was definitely that, you know, that hard hitting truth with it. But I mean, I think for me... I kind of went through that stage. I definitely felt all those things. Like I was running out of time. But something, I'm sure therapy was a big part of it, got me out of that. And then I started mm. to realize, like, I think even by the time I hit 40 or like 35, I feel like it kind of subdued. Like, I feel like 35 was a scary age for me. But when it mm. kind of came and passed, I was a little more at ease. And I think some of it was I was out of that cycle of weddings. So, was maybe a little less, you know, in your face. And then I also realized like I wasn't left behind, like all my friends were still there. Who cares if I'm the fifth wheel? Like I started to realize like it didn't matter as much as I thought. Definitely by late 30s, I felt that. But in my early 30s, it was there was a lot of internal conflict. I never really wanted kids or had a strong feeling about kids. So the biological clock yeah. wasn't the pressure. It was more like have I peaked already? <laughs> so if I've already peaked, is it just downhill from here? And mm. I'm just going to have to settle for someone. And I kept thinking like, one, is the dating pool dwindling? And two is, am I going downhill? Which is not the case. No. But like, that's truly how I felt at the time. Like, wow, this is, this is what it's like, you know, going downhill, <laughs> going to geriatric mode. Yeah. And I was the same. The biological clock stuff, for me, didn't really actually hit until I had a partner. It, but I mm -hmm. met my partner when I was 37. So probably like within the year or two of like getting a little more serious and realizing like that is something I wanted, it didn't hit mm -hmm. me then. And so I agree with you, like that wasn't what was driving it, but it was this pressure to fit in, I think for me, like this pressure that, and also like a pressure to succeed in a weird way, because like everything yeah. else in life, like I, you know, had figured out how to get the career and to like live where yes. I wanted to. But this was an area like I felt like I couldn't figure out. And that made me feel like a failure. So that added to it. So it was like the combination of not feeling control of the situation, plus seeing people like actually get the result you're longing for, that took a hit to my ego. That's a really good comparison of 
30s is when you hit a stride in your career. Mm -hmm. So you feel like I have a path I'm working towards and I have a goal and I can accomplish these goals. But dating, you couldn't see it in the same way. You can't just be ambitious and find a partner. It doesn't work that way. But you kind of want to treat it that way. And I also think that during this decade, I just, I think what got me out of this was seeing that my choices were getting better. Mm -hmm. The dating pool actually gets better. And now I'm starting to address this more head on. Is if you are about to hit 30 or early 30s, you feel like you're running out of time. You're actually not because I felt like I was able to get better choices later in my 30s because I got better. Mm -hmm. I worked on myself. So I was able to attract much better matches. A hundred percent. And I think that like hits on the everyone good is already taken, which is another one of these perceptions. And the reality too is like, what does that even mean? What does good mean? Like that's such an arbitrary marker in the first (laughs) place. But also, I think it it took me realizing like there's nothing wrong with being single and there's nothing special about being in a relationship. Yes. And I still say that currently as someone that's in a relationship. I think for a long time, I thought like those people were chosen. They were special. Yes. They, you know, were desirable. They knew what they were doing. They knew how to navigate this world that I couldn't navigate. But I've learned, you know, a lot of it is, you know, some of it, it's like that you just were ready earlier. Like there were parts of your life that this became more of a priority. I don't think there's necessarily like anything that made you more or less deserving of it. And I think that is something that I like the whole myth of everyone good is already taken, especially in today's world where people are popping in and out of the dating pool. Like that's just not true. And quite frankly, if I had gotten married by 30, I would be divorced by now. I mean, I like exactly. I was not set up yeah. for relationships. I had terrible communication skills. I was just still playing the game. That would have been a horrible marriage to be in. So I'm glad I didn't get married in my 30s. And it wasn't until later in my 30s that I realized I had a lot of shit I need to work on. Yeah. I mean, that's a reason why I think actually it's easier than this everyone good is already taken myth because you know yourself so much better. And you know what good looks like for you. It's not the generic version of good. And that's what I think this myth is getting at. It's like, oh, they're attractive. They're smart. Like they have the good on paper. That's what good equals. Where you you learn that's not what actually matters in a relationship. And now being far removed from my 30s, I can say, one, people get re-released back into the dating pool all the time. (laughs) (laughs) So they keep cycling. and. Two, what you see from the outside externally of a relationship is not indicative of whether that relationship is healthy or not. Mm -hmm. So if you think, oh, this person's such a good husband, they were taken early, you know, and I'll never find a guy like that. Uh, You know, jury's still out on that because you only see what people want you to see from their relationships. It does not mean that they are the picture perfect relationship that you're hoping to be in. I have a friend that met her partner in college. And again, not saying like, uh, this probably is the right partner for her. I'm not saying that in any way, but some of it's just luck, right? Like they just happen to meet each other earlier in yes. their life. And you could also say maybe they were more relationship minded. That's what they were looking for, whatever. But it doesn't mean that like they were, you know, any more ready than someone that maybe just like didn't have that luck too. Yes, definitely. And as May Lee so wisely told us when she came on our show, she said, you can have everything, just not all at once. So I do believe this with this time pressure is that some of us didn't get married in our 30s, not because we weren't deserving of it. We didn't prioritize it. Yeah, that wasn't 100%. number one for us. And the people who did prioritize it, they got married, but they deprioritize other things of their life. So you have to think you went forward in other areas of your life, except for the the relationship marriage department. And those people had to stunt some of the other aspects of their life. Yeah. Or maybe they did like, you know, move forward at all. But again, it comes down to luck. Like it just, there was an element of luck for them in that regard. Yeah. I mean, luck, timing, everything. And you won't know how anything pans out till you're on your deathbed. 
No. Right? That is the end result. So everything is in flux right now. You're going through something temporary. Turning 30 doesn't mean anything other than the fact that you've been around for 30 years. Yeah, that is it. I do want to bring up like the very real realities of the biological clock, though. But before we do, let's take a quick break to hear from our partners. This episode is sponsored by Via. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom. But did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Via has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your sense increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the high love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Via also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATABLE at viahemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to viahemp.com and use the code DATABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's viahemp.com and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATABLE at oseamalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over for $60. So head to oseamalibu.com and use the code DATABLE for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall credit card bill would enact harm credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. So this whole biological clock thing, like we were talking about it. And I think, you know, again, I'm not going to argue like it's not there because it very much is. And I know there are a subset of our listeners that want that really bad and they want the family They want to have children, and it feels like finding a partner is a hindrance to that. Mm. And there is a very strong, like, fear of I'm running out of time. Of course, like, you know, egg freezing and all that is a choice that everyone makes. I do want to just say, though, as someone that did it, like, I think there's a couple things. Like, one is I thought it was going to actually be a lot worse than it was, like, in the sense of, like, how difficult it was and painful. So Mm -hmm. I think that was a huge relief personally that I was able to do that because it put a lot of that pressure away. That being said, there's no guarantees with it. Like I could go to use these eggs in like a couple years and realize that none of them are viable. Like that's totally a risk you're doing with this. So I think modern medicine isn't the total answer, but it's something. And I think that's something that can at least maybe give people hope. Like, again, it's a personal decision. Understand that it can be expensive. My company at the time also helped me pay for it. So there's a lot of factors here. But looking at some of those alternatives could relieve some of that pressure. Again, not saying it's going to relieve all of it. Yeah. And the question we always like to ask is, do you want kids or do you want a family? Mm -hmm. If you are prioritizing having kids, meaning you're okay having kids on your own, there are many ways to do that. 
Yeah. Prioritize that. Fully respect that decision. If what you're looking for is a family, meaning you want to partner and then raise kids together with a partner, then prioritizing the right partner is way more important than prioritizing having kids. And what we've seen is when daters prioritize having kids, that becomes the topic of conversation on every date. Do you want kids? You know, are kids in your future? Without even assessing if this person is a viable partner for you. And what happens then? You meet someone who's ready for kids. They may not be a good partner for you. And you're going to raise fucking kids with this person. Right. That's probably going to be a lot worse in the long run. So as scary as it is, and obviously talking from someone who doesn't have kids, who doesn't want kids, it's like, if you want a family, prioritize your partner, finding the right partner for you. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're dating later in life, in your 30s, I love that that's later in life, know, but it but is <laughs> in some way. I think it's reimagining what that looks like. Yeah. Like I know for me, I did kind of get comfortable being like, it was a hard no for me to date someone with kids or date someone divorced like earlier in my 20s. Mm-hmm. But I came around to that. I didn't end up with that. But like that wasn't something I was as closed off to as I once was because I realized like it might just look different than it did. Yeah. And it still might look different for me than I thought it would with just like how this actually plays out someday. So I think that's part of it is just letting yourself be more open as you, you know, date later on. And it's okay to change your mind. And I think that's a major point I want to bring up is I felt like in my 30s, all of my decisions were permanent. Yeah. That you had to commit to this career, commit to this person, commit to the city, commit to this lifestyle. Everything is in flux. The impermanence of life is what makes life so beautiful. So also know that your mind could change. Last year, I did want to have kids. This year, I don't. In the future, I could probably want a family. And that could mean kids of my own or someone else's kids because my current partner has kids of his own. And to me, like it's actually, I never thought about it, kind of exciting to know that I have this potential for an extended family somehow. So things are always changing and be okay to the evolution of whatever you experience. And don't be so locked down to, oh, I must get married. I must have kids or mm-hmm. I definitely don't want kids or I definitely don't want to get married. Yeah. And we have a great episode that we'll link in the show notes that was about the decision to have kids or not with Kate Kennedy. And she was great. We went into all this in much more detail. So if this is a topic of interest, we don't want to like gloss over it, but also there's an entire episode. But want to acknowledge it's a real part of dating in your 30s, but it doesn't mean that like dating in your 30s is hopeless. Like there's other ways and there's also other benefits of just like having the love life you always wanted that may or may not include children. You know, I was just thinking about this and you, what you said made me realize something is that you actually just, what we're scared of in our 30s is the lack of choices. Mm -hmm. In our 20s, the world is our oyster. You can have kids if you want to, you don't have to. You can get married if you want to, you don't have to. But we're afraid that in our 30s, some of those options get taken away. The dating pool dries up, so you have less choices, or you can't conceive, so Mm -hmm. there's that option taken away from you. So I would say then, maybe instead of thinking about your choices being taken away, think about how you can broaden your choices even more, like freezing your eggs is a great example. That's a way to make sure you have the option later in life. I think that's exactly it. It's like what's being taken away from us is such the focus opposed to what we're gaining. Like yeah. another one, for instance, that we hear as one of the perceptions that makes it hard is it's hard to meet people because you mm-hmm. no longer have like the school environment or you're going out as much to like bars and clubs and whatever it is. Yeah. I would argue that I feel like meeting people in those environments, like of course people meet people in college. I don't want to say like you don't, but like you were just not developed at that stage. And like, I know in my 20s, I was getting super drunk, having mostly (laughs) just like, you know, hook up, like, you know, things that like just were not, the person didn't get to know me and I didn't get to know them at all. I feel like dating in my 30s is really where I hit my stride of knowing myself and actually having like quality conversations. And I feel like this is a total myth. It's hard to meet people, like especially in today's world with like dating apps and even going out. Like 
there are so many people out of all ages. You just need to find the right environments. It does not dry up. And it's like once you hit 30, you're just like sitting at home every night by yourself, like watching Netflix. Like that's not the truth. Exactly. It's quantity over quality in your 20s. Okay. <laughs> I did the rec sport, like dog sports. We oh did my softball. God, yeah. You know, my team was called Don't Come on My Base. And we used to like <laughs> go out drinking after Mine the games. Mine was cleats and, yeah. and cleavage. <laughs> <laughs> None of this will fly today. <laughs> Just saying that. It looks so yeah. inappropriate. You, but you know, we went. You would go out and you go drinking with like fifty other no. people who are getting sloshed. Yeah, quantity is there. What's the quality? <laughs> Zero. I mean, I barely remember anybody's names. No. Like, I do have friends that met through kickball and are. Married with kids. So Same. it's possible. We're not saying it's not possible with any of these. But think about all the interactions that did not go there. So many. I can count them on my hands of how many times I had drunken makeouts that went nowhere. Absolutely nowhere with this. Well, it just shows you there's an opportunity to meet someone no matter what environment you're in. So don't get stuck on the environments you're used to in no. your 20s. Right. Because the 30s, it's even better. And then guess what? In your 30s, you can drive where you want to be. You want to pick up a sport, a hobby. You want to go to the museum. These are things you want to do. Yeah. And if someone catches your eye at one of these events or environments, that's the best situation. Well, that is that is the beauty is that you're now doing stuff for yourself because you know yourself. Yes. Where before you're like, I should be going out every night and I should be doing this. And now it's more intentional if you let it be. Again, like <laughs> everything's a choice. Yeah. The other piece too is you are not the last person that's single in your 30s. Like I had to remind myself of this, even yes. if all my friends were, you know, with significant others. I was not alone in my circumstance. In my 30s, I met a lot of new friends too. UA and I became friends in our 30s. Yeah. Like I think there's a myth too that like you stop making friends and the only people that are your friends are like the people you met before you turned 30 and you can't make it to friends as an adult. That is total BS, especially if you're living in a city that's filled with a lot of single people that are, you know, of all ages. Yeah, that's a very good point. And maybe it's also, if you feel like you're stuck in a rut with dating, maybe it's time to prioritize your friendships yeah. over dating and have dating be the peripheral relationships around your friendships. I mean, like there's so many articles supporting that your friendships can bring you more joy than a relationship can. So I think that's a good way to reframe that. And also know that, if you don't make an effort to meet new people, they're not going to fall in your lap. Mm -hmm. So take some accountability too. I know a lot of people who are like, well, I don't, I don't do anything. <laughs> I'm just at home swiping on apps. Right. I can't meet anybody. Well, yeah, duh, because you haven't left your front door. <laughs> like go do things that you love to do and you're guaranteed to meet new people. Yeah. I do feel like the one thing I noticed, though, in my 30s that maybe does support this a little more was that I feel like in my 20s, I didn't have to rely on apps as much because there was mm. always like something going on. Sure. There was always like someone in my network, like a friend of a friend. Sure. And then I kind of felt like after I broke up with my ex, which was around like, I feel like I was like 32, 33. I felt like my like pool did a little dry up, at least the people I knew, because I'm like, oh, I know all my friends' friends. Like, There's not as many people out there. Of course, that could have been just my own perception. Maybe it was part of it was just I wasn't in the right place to be meeting someone new. A lot of the times we'll you know, blame the external when a lot of it really comes down to like how we're processing. And like you said, maybe I wasn't going out of my way as much. Like I was just doing what was like comfortable in there. That being said, though, I found other paths, you know, like I met people online, like it's not like there's no other way. You just might have to get a little more creative. But also, let's be honest, your standards are higher, too. That's In your true. 20s, That's I was true. like, you have a single friend, bring it on. <laughs> that could be why it's harder to meet people, too. If you're not looking for something serious in your 20s or you don't have that pressure, it's like easier to just date whoever. Where like yeah. in your 30s, like it doesn't mean that you can't have fun on dates. Like absolutely you can. 
but there is a little more intentionality behind it. Yes. I would argue that's a good thing, but like that's I can very see good how it could feel like there's less people for people. Yes. Definitely quantity wise, there are going to be less people that you would even consider going out with. But again, we want to focus on quality over quantity. Quantity doesn't matter. I think that's like the thing that we've <laughs> drilled home a lot. And no I shit. mean, for me too, like I've the times I've actually met people on dating apps is when I wasn't like dating so many people at once. Mm-hmm. I was balancing it with other parts of my life. Yep. Okay. The last big perception of why it's hard to date in your 30s. Everyone has baggage. <laughs> Basically, you know, you've been through some shit in the last decade and you've got the heartbreak or maybe you even have already been married and now you have children or I want to say children are baggage. I don't mean it that way, but you know, like it comes with a little more than just two people starting out fresh together. It's not as simple, but you can also say that about your 20s. The easiest time to date was junior high. <laughs> you know, or you're when you're born. Your parents yeah. And, yeah, well, yeah, you have no standards and you have no life experiences. You can really bond over your math class, whatever. As we get older, yeah, you're going to accumulate more life experience. And what comes with that could be baggage or experience, however you want to frame it. And everyone's going to come with that. I would argue that this is what makes people more interesting. Yes. Do you really want to bond over your love for music festivals? Or do you want to bond over like the actual life experiences that you've had? A hundred percent. And I think too, like we were talking about earlier, having people that aren't just, you know, totally fresh that may have families already gives an opportunity to redefine what that means. Also like breakups, like of course, like right when you're fresh out of a breakup, maybe it's not the best time to date. But once you heal, I think you can actually be a way better partner because you've learned from the last experience. I feel like I was not nearly as introspective before my breakup because I went to therapy. I learned about mm-hmm. myself. I learned what was important for me in a partner. Like I wouldn't have known any of this had I not gone through that relationship. So I feel like that was an asset to like future partners because I did a lot of that learning. And that's probably why so many people are scared to date in their 30s is because they don't want to repeat the yeah. heartbreak yeah. that they've experienced. But like you said, Julie, it's like we learn from that and that we become more well-rounded people when we date. So we attract others who are on a similar journey. And then you realize in your 30s, it's not really about age. Part of the beauty of being in your 30s is that you can date down or up. You yeah. can go 20s, you can go 40s, and nobody would judge you. 50s, <laughs> so 60s, great. whatever you want to do. <laughs> you can legit date anybody and you're a fair game for everybody. So it's a great time to learn from all of these different people in an intentional way, obviously. But it's such a privilege to be in your 30s and to be able to date people from all walks of life. I kind of hate this word baggage for that reason. Yeah. Because like even when I was describing it, I'm like, oh, technically people would say like if they were divorced or they have kids, that's baggage. I know. And I feel like that word just feels so negative. It's life experience. That's what they have is life experience. And it's also such a generalization because everyone has different life experience. I would argue that even if you've had no relationships the last decade, you still have some stuff that you're holding on to and life experience that you know may or may not be any easier to navigate through than someone who is coming out of a divorce. It's all relative. And you just need to be with someone that understands your background and can accept it and work with you. And if someone labels your life experience as baggage, that is not the right person for you. Right. (laughs) Because it's very obvious they're not ready to connect on that level. But also know that as we get older, it's going to get more and more complex. So... You know, like, don't think about, oh, it's in my 30s that this is so so complicated, all all these different people from all different experiences. No, it just gets more and more complicated and more nuanced as we get older. Yeah, we always talk about, like, the relationship experience. Like, why is that even so important for people? Because I think that's something that, like, comes up in this term of baggage, or if you don't have relationship experience, that it's also a problem, right? Yeah. You haven't been in enough relationships. What's wrong with you? Like, why is that even something that we're focused on? My take is the relationship I had with someone else is totally different 
than the relationship I'm having with you. So at the end of the day, we're in a new relationship together. And, you know, you could learn through a past breakup, but you could also learn in many other ways. Like it's not just that way. So I think it's just so short-sighted when we get so fixated on people's past. Yeah. And then people are going to have more of a past. Yeah. That's just... Than not. That's okay, though. Like, there's something wrong with that. That's not like a problem. But we see it as a problem societally. Okay. So I think that was like a pretty good summary of some of the main things that people are going through. Of course, I'm sure there's going to be more too, but it kind of hit on a lot of the pressures and the feelings of why dating is so hard. Hopefully, we debunk some of it. I want to talk about our like personal journeys too of like how we learn to realize that like dating in your 30s could actually be freaking awesome if you allow for it. But before we do, let's take a quick break to hear from our partners. So both of us met partners later in life. I met my partner at 37 and you met your partner before your current partner around 37 also, and now your current partner in your 40s. Mm-hmm. So we're clear proof, though, that you can meet people. Relationships are possible. In fact, I would argue some of the best relationships are yet to come. How did you kind of get past this mentality for yourself? That don't dwell so much on the age. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that what it is? Uh, yeah. Well, <sighs> Part of it is like, you just have to experience it to know that yeah, it does get better. I truly, truly believe that it does get better. But if I take inventory of the people I've been involved with as I've gotten older, they've definitely been getting better and better for me. So I feel like at least I'm on to something. Mm-hmm. If I had been with the person that I was with in my 20s, I've said this time and time again, we definitely would be divorced by now because <laughs> we were so not a good fit for each other. Yeah. But with time, I can I can spot pretty quickly now whether someone is good for me. Yeah, no, I agree. I think taking inventory is a big one of just like the dates I went on, just like how much more, you know, in the zone I was and feeling like myself and feeling like our conversations had more depth than my 20s. Mm-hmm. And I feel like there's this feeling, oh, when you hit 30, you just have to settle for the first person that comes along and, you know, just get it done. Mm -hmm. But I personally did not feel that way at all. Like I felt like I got a more clear view of what I was looking for. And then I was able to find someone that met everything I wanted in that sense, plus more than I even thought was possible in a relationship. Because, you know, like I changed what I was looking for. And I changed the definition of what it was too. Absolutely. And as hopefully, as we age, we become more independent, we become more happy in being alone, Yeah, that we no longer see a relationship as survival. It's purely additive. And we only want to engage with someone who is additive to our lives. Yeah. And so when you reach that level of independence, There's no other feeling that can describe how empowering that is to feel like I can be on my own. I feel fine on my own. I'm happy on my own. And if someone wants to come along for the ride with me, great. If not, I'm very content where I am. So is that just like learning with age? Because it's interesting when you talk to people in their 40s and older, I feel like the pressure isn't as much as the 30s. So Mm. some of it is just like recognizing that it's not the be all end all. There's more to life. I think in your 30s, it's like if I'm not with this person, then I'm alone as like a bad thing or I must find someone else where like being alone becomes more of like a viable option as you get older and you feel like more comfortable doing so too. I don't know. I think in my 30s, like I kind of have that revelation on dates being like, would I rather be here or would I rather just be hanging out by myself? Mm. And if the answer was being hanging out by myself, like I would be like, this is not the right fit. Where in my 30s, I might try to like push it a little more because that didn't seem like an option in the first place. Well, do you think it's also that if you think about it, in your 20s, you're not really making that many decisions? Yeah. Or the decisions aren't that big. But in your 30s, you feel like either I'm going to make these life-changing decisions with somebody or I just got to commit to it by myself. And that's daunting to be like, where am I going to be? Am I going to buy a place? Am I going to stay at this job? Am I 
going to invest in this portfolio, whatever. Like it almost feels like it's better if you just make these decisions with somebody, right? And that's probably what it is because by 40, you're like, well, I'm making all these decisions myself now. I was just going to say that. I think it's the realization and that probably hits different for different people. Like for me, I think it was 35. Like I felt way less pressure at 35 than I did at 30. Mm. And I can't speak to 40 fully because I was in a relationship at that stage, but I was single Mm -hmm. at 30 and 35. And the pressure at 35 kind of, I think it's because I got like over it in the sense that like I can just do things that I want to do. And I started to think about like my life isn't going to look how I, I thought it would be. And, you know, buying a place on my own is totally a viable thing to do or whatever it is where I wasn't waiting anymore. I think it's like getting out of that waiting game was empowering. So maybe it goes back to what we said in the beginning. It's because when we're young, we don't think about life past 30. Yeah. So everything we're doing in our teens and our 20s is building towards the relationship, right? It's like once you hit 30 and you're in a relationship and you have a family, you're that's it. Yeah. (laughs) There's nothing else to talk about. So I think it's in your 30s you discover There is life beyond that, and that's a life I get to build for myself. Yeah, in one of our most popular episodes, Finding Love at Any Age, where we had Mei Lee as well, we talked about her earlier, we had her come back Mm -hmm. and talk about her engagement in her 50s. And that episode, like I remember, like we had a discussion about it, and there was a topic on Facebook around it. And one person was like, the operative word is can, like you can, Mm -hmm. it's a possibility but not likely. (laughs) And I think that's a mindset. Like I think ultimately, yeah, of course, like there's no guarantees in life with anything, but if you don't believe you can do it, then you probably sure as hell can't do it. But if you look at can as like, there's no end versus can like there's less, then I think that, you know, hearing stories like that, it's really empowering to realize that data can still be fun. You can still fall in love. You can do all the things. It doesn't end at 30. Okay, well, think about this too. When you're in your 20s and your 30s, the world around you is cheering you on to get into a relationship. All of the advertising, all the dating apps are marketed towards people in their 20s and 30s, the ripe age to get married and have families. But when you're past that, like 40s and 50s, there's no marketing towards you. Yeah. There's no societal pressure to get married. Yeah. Right. So once you decide to get into a relationship or you want to get married in your 40s, 50s, that's purely a decision you make for yourself. Nobody else is rooting for you to do that. So that is, to me, mind blowing to think about is all the pressure you feel right now in your 30s might not even be coming from you. No, it's not. You may not you may not want to be getting married because you want to get married because everybody around you is telling you you should get married. This sounds weird, but I think the pandemic was a pivotal point for me because mm. the pressure was gone of trying like having to date and having to meet someone. Yeah. Everyone's just like, "Oh, stay at home and do nothing." Like that was the norm. It wasn't like, "Who are you dating? Who are you in a relationship with? Where is this yep. going?" And that was really liberating to not have that pressure because I realized that a lot of it was external, was this fear Mm -hmm. of measuring up that we talked about and getting to the root of like what your individual fear is. And ultimately when fear and scarcity is driving decisions, like that's not a good place to be in for any of us. So I want people to take away from this. You absolutely can't find love at any age. Dating in your 30s, at least in my opinion, and I'm gathering from UAs too, is one of the best times to date and to find love. So it's not that life is over. But when we have these, you know, pressures seeping in, that's when it becomes really problematic. And it's like, how do we let that out? It's an exercise, it's therapy, it's continued practice. But that I think is really the secret of enjoying dating in your 30s. Right. What is in your control and what is out of your control? What do you get to do because you're single in yeah. your 30s is a question I wish I fucking asked myself when I was 30. Right. What a privilege it was to have not as many responsibilities, to be making money, to be living the life I wanted to because I was single in my 30s. Yeah. I had friends in their 30s who just had young kids. They had to cater to their kids 24-7. 
why couldn't I see my life in that way? It's like, it's not what I don't have. It's look at all this greatness I, I get to have around me. Yeah, that's the shift that needs to happen. I think the other piece too is like there is no rush, even though it feels it. And this is coming from someone that I feel like I felt the pressure when I met someone that I'm like, great, I met him. Now it's time to do all the things, you know, we must move in within a year. They get married within two years. Like we're on the fast track because time is running out. So I am someone that definitely felt the pressure. I don't want to say it was like all alleviated just because I met someone Mm. or because I got older, all that. I think it does creep in from time to time. But I I have to remind myself that like, first of all, there is a lot of enjoyment that happens at every stage. So why rush through it? Yes. And then second, like just because you're, you know, at a certain age point doesn't mean that you shouldn't give the relationship the breathing room and the way to develop. Like marriage is still a big decision. Like you still want to know who you're with and that it's the right choice for the two of you. And that doesn't need to get sped up just because of these arbitrary timelines and self-induced pressure. And we have to remember that, that like, whenever we meet that person, like we'll figure it out and the timelines and the structure might not look like we thought, but it doesn't mean that it's like panic mode and we just must go at all costs either. Listen, if I've learned anything about life is that nothing goes as planned. Yeah. And if it goes as planned... It doesn't go as planned later in that plan. (laughs) Yeah. I have a friend who was on a timeline. She needed to get engaged, married, and pregnant with her first child in one year, which she did. And she had a second child and they renovated their house and la, la, la. (laughs) And now she's at a point where she's like, oh, shit, where was I in all of this? Mm. I forgot to develop myself all to sacrifice yourself for an arbitrary timeline, thinking that's what would make you happy. And once she was able to hit all those milestones, she lost herself in the process. So if I could ever say anything back to myself in my early 30s is don't lose yourself in the process. In whatever it is you're chasing, it's not worth losing yourself over. Yeah. And no one has it totally figured out. No, Even if you're in a long-term relationship for years, Everyone is going through some sort of transition at certain times. Like that's just life. And it's easy to get hung up on it when you're single in your 30s. But remembering that, you know, someone that's with their person today might not be tomorrow or your person's just around the corner. Like that's what's exciting about dating is like every day, like you just don't know what's going to happen. And when you're single. So It's really just the shift of what's to come, not all the time that's lost. I mean, look at my life, for example. This time last year, I was on this track to like (laughs) doing all these things, trying for kids, you know, trying to get married by the end of the year, come to find out he had been cheating this whole time. It's like, shit, I would have never guessed that for myself. And I obviously I would have never planned that for myself. But guess what? When life does that for you, you go, Oh, shit. Who do I have to fall back on? Oh, myself. Mm -hmm. Thank God. And then now look at your life. Like you're happy in different ways. Like I'm not saying you wouldn't be happy if all things had worked out that way. But look at what it brought that you wouldn't have even known and realized. Absolutely. Absolutely. So don't get into that one track mind. You must do this by this time and hit these milestones because I can guarantee you once you hit them, you're going to be questioning Why isn't this making me happy? Yeah. And what's next? There's always a next. Look, dating in your 30s is hard, but also dating in your 20s is hard in different ways. (laughs) Dating in your 40s is hard in different ways. Like it's all relative and different. So my takeaway is that it's all what you make it. It's just as good a time as any because there's other benefits of knowing yourself well, knowing what you're looking for, being more intentional, having more depth and breadth and all the things. So how do we just focus on what's positive about dating in your 30s instead of getting hung up on what's not? Because, you know, the reality is we can't time travel back. (laughs) We have to work with where we are today. Yep. You are what you believe. Yeah. So if you believe that dating is harder in your 30s, guess what? Dating is going to be harder for you in your 30s. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you want to get out of this rut, reframe, 
and regroup with yourself Mm -hmm. and every morning say, what do I get to do because I'm dating in my 30s? Yeah, Get into the mindset that you get to have the privilege of even dating and choosing a partner in your 30s. You have the privilege of going on apps and having all these resources. You get the privilege of listening to Datable. (laughs) Datable didn't exist When I was in my 30s, in my early 30s, I wish it did. (laughs) I mean, there are studies, too, of like parenting, too, that, you know, parents in their 30s, yeah, you're not as young as maybe you would have been in your 20s, but there's the emotional benefits that you bring and the sense of security and like all these other benefits you can bring your children. So yeah, it's always, there's always a positive if you choose to see it and there's always a negative if you choose to dwell on it. Yep. So it's your choice. (laughs) It's your choice. The best is yet to come. That's what I like to think of. (laughs) It really is. The best I can say, speaking from the future for most of you, the best (laughs) is yet to come. It's true. When you get older. It's true. (laughs) Great. This is such a good discussion. I love airing it out. Hopefully this was, you know, comforting to at least, you know, be validated that what you're feeling isn't crazy. Like a lot of people go through this. There's all this societal pressure and myths out there of why it's so bad. It's hard to not ignore that, but we have to ignore it. Yes, absolutely. Just think back to the time when you're 16 and your crush didn't like you back and how devastating that felt. This is basically what it is. (laughs) You know, when you look back, when you're in your 50s and you look back to your 30s, you're like, piece of cake. What was I doing? (laughs) It's so true. It's so true. Love it. All right. Thank you all. Um, We will do more of these discussions just between Julie and I. If you have any ideas for topics, you can email us hello at datablepodcast.com. You can DM us on Instagram at datablepodcast is the handle, or you can write us a rating review. Have some topic suggestions there. Just go on an Apple podcast, give us five stars, and tell us what you would like to hear on a future episode in the body of your review. Yes. And make sure to get your brunch talk questions in also. All right. We'll see you all next week. Stay, Stay datable. datable. The Datable Podcast is part of the Frolic Media Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at Datable Podcast and visit datablepodcast.com for access to all the episodes and our premium programs. Also, make sure to subscribe today if you haven't already on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform so you are the first to get all the latest episodes. And most importantly, Stay dateable. <laughs>